half cocked, but fully loaded, right? The title of my message this morning is Saved by Grace Unto Good Works. Saved by Grace Unto Good Works. This is kind of a primer. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. This is kind of a primer to what we're going to be doing at the beginning of the year. I really feel like the Lord is going to, uh, our first part of our 21-day fast and stuff in January, we'll be, uh, we're going to be discovering uh, what our purpose is. Which of us, you know, I believe God has a specific purpose for every single one of us. We were created in Christ, recreated in Christ Jesus for good works. That's what the me message is. We'll get to that towards the end of the message. But God has a purpose for each one of us, and there's a, a task for each one of us to do. And uh, to find your fullest joy in life, you know, joy, J-O-Y, Jesus first, others second, right? And what's the why for? Yourself last. You know, if that's really the case, then there needs to be, you need to find some place, you need to find your groove, you need to find your place where you can really serve Jesus by serving others. We serve him by serving others. So that's something I want us to really find out in, in, a, in a more practical way, in an applicable way in this upcoming new year. How many of you would like to be used by the Lord in a greater capacity in 2023? Amen. Good. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, verses 12 through 21. Romans 5, 12, therefore, just as though one man's sin entered the world, speaking about Adam, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who has to come. Verse 15, but the free gift is not like the offense, for, for if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. Verse 16, and the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses, results in justification. For if by one man's off offense death reigned through the one, much more those who received abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as though one man's offense, uh, through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offer, offense might abound, but where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. So that as sin reigns in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Marvelous passage of scripture that talks about the difference between the, the two men, Adam being the, the prototype that God created as a result of Adam. God, when Adam was built, was initially created, he was without sin. He was perfect. He had a, an intimate relationship with God. God would come down in the cool of the afternoon and walk with Adam and talk with Adam and have a conversation with him. It wasn't until Adam disobeyed that sin entered the world, death entered the world, sickness and disease entered the world. The world itself became uh, corrupt. The animal kingdom became corrupt to the point where, by Genesis chapter 6, God had to destroy the earth. So as a result of Adam's disobedience, we've all been born with a sin nature. You know, no matter how hard you try not to do what's, you know, what, you're not, what you don't want to do, you have a sin nature that you were born in, you, you were born with. That's a thing that hinders you from having uninhibited relationship with God. Not only that, but we also have sins that we committed. We have willful acts of disobedience that we've committed, knowing that it's wrong to do to him to know to do good, but does, does not do good to him, it's wrong. So we've done those kinds of things. We also are doing things that we really don't want to do, but we find ourselves doing. Anybody find themselves in that way? You find yourself doing stuff that I really don't want to do that. It's not in my heart. It's not in my plan. It's not what I want for my life, but it seems, it seems like those things are happening. Well, the good news is this, that Jesus is the answer to all of that, saints. Jesus is the answer to deliver us from our sinful nature. 
He is the answer to empower us unto righteousness, to empower us unto good works. So we see here, you know, and this works and faith thing has always been mixed up. And I think it's one of the things that Satan tries to convolute. That's why I had to specifically pray for a spirit of revelation and wisdom and understanding this morning so that we can get, we can get this. This is, this is fundamental. This is basic. This is, this is huge. If you can get your heart and your spirit totally convinced of the reality of your necessity for the grace of God and the mercy of God, and you're living your life dependent upon that, and you're not living your life outside of that. Anytime that you are not relying upon the grace of God and the mercy of God and the power of the Holy Spirit within you, then you're functioning from your flesh. And of the flesh, the Bible says, no good thing can come. It's corrupt. You know, from our flesh, it's deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? You know, so we have to come to the place where we are living a continuous dependency upon what Jesus has provided for us. We're in a, we're in a state where we're constantly conscious of his presence and everything that we do, we're, we're drawing upon his life. We're drawing upon his grace. We're drawing upon his mercy. We don't take his grace or his mercy for granted. You know, we don't just live our lives as if we're not dependent upon him. Because as soon as you do, how many of you have tried to do some things, good things, on your own without drawing upon the life of Jesus in you and dependent upon him, and you just come up short? You know, you come up short for no, you know, it failed, it didn't work. You know, so now how many of you can testify to this, that you've seen things in your life that it was clearly God, because you couldn't have done that yourself. You know God, you know, what, these situations where, where God's at work in you. Yeah, we see that thing as well. So we need to live that on a constant basis. We need to come to that place to be able to enter into the kingdom, a place where we're abandoning our own works. We're abandoning our sense that I deserve heaven, that I'm a good guy. You know what? There is a, there is a multitude of good people in hell. And at the end of the age, when the final judgment is done and all the books are open, there's going to be a host of people that we saw as good, moral people that were trusting in their own self, trying to establish their own righteousness that made their righteousness of God to have no effect upon their lives. And they're going to be in hell because they've trusted in themselves. I think there's going to be more people in hell who trusted in their own good works are than people who are in hell because they had a, a messed up, sinful, filled life. That's a pretty serious, that's a pretty, <coughs> that's just an opinion that I have because I know so many people that are good and moral and they think they deserve heaven. You know, how many times I've asked people, if you were to die today and you before, appeared before the judgment of God and he asked you, why should you in the kingdom of God? What would your answer be? Unless they know Jesus, it's always some kind of a works-based answer. I've been a good person. I've never killed anyone. You know, I, I drive 55 miles an hour. Yeah, who drives 55 miles an hour? And uh, yeah, you're on a 15-mile speed limit. You drive 55 miles an hour, right? <laughs> I'm teasing. No, so they have, that, they have that kind of a thing. Anybody else experience that when you're trying to share your faith with people? They think, I'm a good person. I'm good. I don't need Jesus. I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I deserve heaven. I'm one of the good guys. So there's lots of good people who aren't going to make it. There has to be a place where we abandon our own self-righteousness. Paul talked to the Galatians. He said, oh, foolish Galatians, who's bewitched your thinking? Who's put a spell on your mind that you began in faith trusting in Jesus, but now you think you're going to be made perfect and complete by your own good works? He says, I fear for your souls. He feared for their souls because they were trusting in themselves, not trusting in the grace and mercy of God. So we see this, this, this passage covers so much. I love this passage. It's interesting, we see this word gift in here. This little short passages, what is that, uh, nine verses. <clears throat> nine verses and we see the word gift appears six times. This word gift appears six times. Look at it for me here, verse 15. But the free gift is not like the offense. Verse 16, and the gift is not like that which came through. And then a little bit later on, but the free gift which came from many offenses results in justification. Verse 17, the gift of righteousness. Verse 18, the free gift came to all men. So we see this gift through here six different times. This word gift is the word charisma. It's, the word, it's where we get the word charismatic, charismatic churches that believe in the functioning of the Holy Spirit. We're a charismatic church. We believe that signs and wonders, uh, gift, giftings are all, all for today. We believe in the perpetuity of spiritual gifts. We believe in the continuing uh, work of the Holy Spirit and, and found out throughout, all throughout Scripture. 
especially through the book of Acts. We believe those things are for today. Jesus said they were. Jesus said, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. Those who believe shall speak with new tongues. They'll cast out devils. They'll lay their hands upon the sick and recover. They'll take up the, the, the demonic and evil and remove it. Take up serpents and remove it. It's talking about scooping up serpents and removing them, not handling snakes for some kind of act of faith or something. So uh, this is, this is what's, what's provided for us. So this word charisma, this word gift, is this. It's the provision of God's divine grace by which a person is pardoned of their sin nature and their sinful thoughts, words, and actions. It's the provision of God's divine grace by which a person is uh, pardoned of their sin nature, of their sinful thoughts, sinful words, and sinful actions. As a result, eternal salvation is given to those who by faith place their trust in what Jesus provided through his sinless life, his sacrificial death, his resurrection, and his ascension. This gift is received without any merit or worthiness of the receiver. It's a gift. It's a gift. You know, some of you guys buy gifts for your loved ones at Christmas time. You buy gifts for your kids. And, of course, we tell them if you're bad, Santa Claus is going to bring you coal and all that other kind of stuff. You know, and it's, you know, we have this works-based kind of a thing when it comes to, you know, those giving of gifts. But God's gift is not based upon whether we deserve it or whether we don't deserve it because none of us deserve it. None of us deserve it. Scripture says there is none righteous, no, not one. Every single person, the only way they're going to receive eternal life, the only way they're going to receive the abundant life that Jesus has provided for them is if they totally put their full trust and their full confidence in the gift of, of God through Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. It's absolutely imperative. So this is a gift is received without merit or worthiness of the receiver. So verse 16 says, uh, let's look at verse 16, I want, to, I want to read that. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came, came from one offense resulted in condemnation, which is guilt, which is punishment. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. This word justification means it's the favorable judgment by which God acquits man and declares them acceptable before him. So there's an acquittal. You know what the word acquittal means? The acquittal means you're, you're guilty, but we're letting you go. We know that you're guilty. You're guilty of sin. Your sin produces death. You deserve hell, but God's going, God, has, God has, has espunged our record. It was espunged our record. You can get your record a sponge. I don't know about all the states, but in Pennsylvania, if you have a criminal record, depending upon what the crimes are, after you, well, the whole sponge will process. But anyhow, long story short is you write to the judge and ask for mercy is what you basically do. You write to the judge and ask for mercy, and he, well, based upon his mercy, you just hope that latter ends up in a good, you know, in a day he got back from vacation, he's feeling pretty good because he caught some big fish on a vacation or whatever, and he's got showing the pictures and bragging about his pictures, and he opens up your letter, he's in a good mood, and he acquits your... He, he sponges your record and forgives you of, your, of the crimes that you've committed. And that expungement actually goes into your file, and no one can ever go in there and see that you committed these crimes. So it's as if you had never committed the crimes. You committed crimes, you were sentenced, you paid a fine, or you went to jail or whatever. You asked for the mercy of the court. The court gives you mercy, and they expunge your record. And no one, it's a sealed record, no one can ever know that you actually committed those crimes because it's sealed. They do a criminal background check on you, go and apply for a job somewhere, and they run the criminal background check, it comes back that you have no crimes, you have, you know, that you're not a criminal because your record has been expunged. That's what the blood of Jesus does, saints. It blots out our sin. It blots it out, removes it, it expunges our record, brings us into right standing before God. We can stand before God. I love this little thing I do, justified. Just if I'd never sinned. That's what happens when you put your full faith and confidence in Jesus. Your record is expunged, and it's just as if you had never justify, justified. Just if I'd never had sinned. Justified. So this justification comes through Jesus. The favorable judgment by which God acquits or sponges man's sins and declares them acceptable before him. Awesome. Verse 17, for if by one man's offense, 
death reigned through the one. You're talking about Adam. By one man's offense, he gave us the sin nature. Death and sin entered the world. Uh, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So, so just in the same way, he's saying, just in the same way that you inherited your sinful nature from Adam, in the same way that as a result of that, you, you, you're, you're living your life in, in sin, and you have iniquities and transgressions, all these kinds of things. In that same way, when you receive Jesus, you receive a new nature, and now you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Now at this moment, you are, your, your records are sponged in the same way, just as sure as you were born in sin, you, when you come to know Jesus as, a, as your Savior, just as sure you've been born again into new life with Christ. Isn't it awesome? Aren't you guys grateful for that? I mean, that should stir your heart and stir your spirit. I never get tired. I never get tired of my salvation. I, 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 never, I, never, I never get to the point where I'm just like blasé about the wonderful grace and mercy of God that brought me into the kingdom. You know, When I got saved, I told Kathy, I found Jesus. No, Jesus found me. I think we found each other. That's truly the case. The Bible says that we love him because he first loved us. Jesus came to the earth to what? To seek and to save those that were lost. He came to a rescue mission. I don't know about you, but I was just living my life doing what I wanted to do, and all of a sudden, Jesus like tapped me on the shoulder and said, hello there, I'm, I'm giving you the revelation of who I am. What are you going to do with this? You know, uh, I'm going to offer, offer myself to you as a gift of life. You know, I discovered that Jesus is truth, he is life, and he is way, and there is no other way, there is no other truth, and there's no life without him. Came to that revelation, it's like it's a no-brainer. Yes, I want you, and I've been following him ever since. God is awesome, saints. Isn't he? He's awesome. Verse 17, for if by one man, Adam, offense, Adam's offenses, death reigned through, the, through him, much more all of us who have received him, received this abundance of grace, this word abundance is superfluity. It's filled to capacity and overflowing. The grace of God is fills the capacity and overflows in our lives. Why is that? So that we can... So that we can we can let the grace of God just flow through our lives and spill onto other people. Yeah, so we can splash the grace of God. So we can be fountains of living water, splashing the grace of God, the love of God, and the mercy of God on others. That's what we're called to. It's awesome. That's the privilege we have. We just got to open up the valve a little bit, let it flow. Verse 17 again. For if by one man's offense Adam has reigned through, through death, much more those who receive the abundance of God's grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Will live, will rule. The word reign isn't just living, but, the, but it's being in charge. It's being in charge. Having the Holy Spirit in your life and living your life in union with the Holy Spirit and dependency upon the Holy Spirit and looking to the Holy Spirit to do things that are beyond your capabilities, that's what it means to reign in life. When you do that, saints... You know, we're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from victory. There's quite a difference for this. We're not contending for something. We're just, we're just coming into agreement with something that's already transpired through what Jesus has provided for us through his death and his resurrection. You know, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us, right? We're more than conquerors, which means we, we reign victoriously over sin, over death, over judgment, over the works of the enemy. No weapon formed against us will prosper. No judgment brought against us will stand because we have the judgment of God on us. The judgment of God is that you are righteous, that you are holy, that you are blameless, that your record is a sponge, that you are, you are my adopted son, you are my adopted daughter. You are transplanted out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. You have the Holy Spirit deposited within you in your heart where you can say, Daddy God, Abba Father, you have that ability. There's a bearing witness, your spirit with God's spirit, that we are the children of God, saints. It's awesome. If you don't have that, dig into the Word. As the revelation comes through His Word, dig into the Word, you'll find that. Ask for that revelation. Ask for, the, ask for the assurance of that. You have not because you ask not. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, the door will be opened unto you, right? This gift of righteousness in verse 17, the gift of righteousness, it's God's offer to mankind of forgiveness of sin and the offer of new life. The acceptance of Jesus 
Jesus' provision restores a person to right standing before God, just as Adam was prior to eating the forbidden fruit. So the moment you say yes to Jesus, the moment you surrender your life to him, the moment you're totally convinced that you are spiritually bankrupt, I do not have the goods necessary to earn my way into heaven. Can't do it. And for no other reason, the scripture says that if we have a thought, a sinful thought, it's just like we did it, right? If the Bible says if you lust after a woman, Jesus said if you lust after a woman in your heart or in your eyes, then you've already committed adultery. If you lust after your neighbor's goods, then you're already a thief. If you hate your brother, then you're what? A murderer. My God, none of us can, can, can do that, right? You might not have ever murdered anybody. You may never have committed adultery. You may never have stole anything. But it certainly is in your heart. And the reason for that is it's in our heart because we have an unregenerated heart. Once we become born again, we receive a new heart. We receive the mind of Christ. Now we're able to have victory over those situations. And when those thoughts do come, they're not your thoughts. It's the enemy projecting his thoughts into your mind, trying to make, him, make you believe that they're his thoughts. Because we have a new mind in Christ. We're new creations in Christ. The gift of righteousness, God's offer to mankind of forgiveness of sin and the offer of new life. The acceptance of Jesus' provision restores a person to right standing before God as Adam was prior before eating the fruit, the forbidden fruit. The righteousness of Christ is imputed, deposited to everyone who calls upon his name. So we can stand before God as being righteous and as being holy, not because of anything that we've done of ourselves. It's because Jesus is deposited into our account. We were, our account was spiritually bankrupt. It was deficient. It was in the, it was in the negative. Anybody ever have the red, red marks on your checkbook? You know, it goes into, <laughs> God bless you for your honesty. You know, for, for you know, it goes, in, it goes into the red. You know, I've been there. I've been there. It's been a long time, but I've been there. And, uh, and it wasn't Kathy's fault. It was my fault for writing checks and not seeing if there's any money in there. And uh, that's why I don't write checks anymore. She just takes care of it all. Just, you know, let her, let her carry it. Uh, was I going to go with that? Forgot? No. I don't know. You recognize that you're spiritually bankrupt and you're desperately in need of God's grace and his mercy. And that's a really good place to be, guys. Forsaking, forsaking your own uh, self-righteousness, forsaking your own, and coming to, coming to the Lord in, de in desperate, desperate need of his grace and of his mercy. You know what the Bible says? He says he resists the proud. When you think you've got something that's valuable to God, you think you've got some of your own righteousness. What is that? That's pride and arrogance. God resists that. You know, God resists that. You remember the, you know, I've done this a hundred times. You know the story of the Pharisee comes to, comes to church to pray, and a sinner comes to church to pray. The Pharisee comes down front, and he got his fancy robes on. He puts up lots, of, lots of coins in the bucket so you can hear all the noise of the money he's giving. He says, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like this common sinner over here, but I'm a righteous man of you, and I tie the 10% of everything that I have, even the herbs and the spices and cumin that I grow in my garden, I tie those things, and, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm you know, righteous, and he walks out. The other sinner guy, the common guy he was referring to, kneels down on the ground, and he pounds his chest, and he says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I have unclean thoughts, unclean lips, unclean actions. Be merciful to me, a sinner. And he gets up and he walks out of the temple. And Jesus asked him, which one of the two was justified? Who was justified? It was the guy that need, knew, knew that he was desperately in need of grace and mercy. That was the guy that would, went away justified, just if he had not done all the things he just confessed. If we confess when we sin, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to what? Cleanse us. Cleanses us with the precious blood of Jesus, removes it from our record, expunges it from our record. This word grace is found all throughout this passage as well. Look at verse 15. But the free gift is not like the offense, for if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounds to many. That word grace pops through there other places as well. Verse 20, grace abound much more. Verse 21, grace might reign through righteousness. The word grace is, uh, is, is the most common definition when you ask people that are churched, you know, what's the definition of grace? What do they say? Unmerited favor. 
But it's so, so much more, guys. It is so much more than just unmerited favor. The word merited means you earn it, right? It's the favor of God. We even had the, a glimpse of the idea of the favor of God upon our lives and his provisions upon our lives. I think we would be, not, we would, we would be able to break the pauper spirit that binds us. We'd be able to break the idea of, you know, of, of living with just existence, and we would live in abundance, abundance of, the, the abundance of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost is provided by Jesus. Grace is the merciful kindness of God by which he inserts his holy influence and favor upon undeserving mankind for the purposes of bringing them to repentance and, uh, and uh, obstructed and unobstructed relationship with himself and with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So it's just God inserting himself, his influence and favor upon undeserving mankind. God's grace affects man's sinfulness not only forgives the repentant sinner, but brings joy and thankfulness to him. It changes the individual to a new creation without destroying his individuality. Uh, grace stands in direct antithesis, diametrically opposed to works, the two being mutually exclusive. So you're either functioning from works or you're functioning from grace. Grace. You know, it's not both. You know, you're either trusting in works or you're trusting in grace. You know, you're either hot or you're cold. You can't be both, right? You either have something that's hot and you have something that's cold. There is no in-between. It's either or. So it's that, same, it's that same kind of an idea here as well. Grace is a favor done without expectation of return. It's a favor done without expectation of return. It's the absolutely free expression of the loving kindness of God to men finding its only motive in the bounty and benevolence of the giver, unearned and unmerited favor. I had to throw that in there because that's what everybody likes that part of grace. But the grace of God influences your heart, saints. The grace of God is, you know, it's, it's because of the grace of God that we even, that he even came after us. It's the grace of God that influenced us in such a way that the spirit of wisdom, revelation, understanding came to us, to, to those of us that are here in the room today and watching online, that know Jesus for sure and have confidence as Dick has confidence, you know, one of the stories that Dick mentioned that wasn't, uh, that was mentioned at, I don't think we even mentioned it, you mentioned it at the funeral either, was his last day, uh, Dick's, Hansen's last day. Uh, he was uh, slipping, his, his life uh, was slipping from him. He was Monday, uh, he died on uh, Tuesday morning, I think it was, right? Five o'clock in the morning. And he was, he knew he was dying and he, and he was ready to go. And he took it, he fell asleep. And he woke up and he was mad because he was still alive. <laughs> Can you imagine that? The guy wakes up from a nap and he's mad that he didn't die. Man, talk about faith. Talk about knowing where you're going. Huh? There's no question that guy knew where he was going, man. He was ready to go. He, a couple of times he woke up and he said, God, why am I still here? He actually woke up and told, turned to Pat and said, why am I still here? You know, I'm in the dying process. I'm, I'm ready to be with Jesus. Pretty awesome, man. The fear of death is swallowed up in the victory of the cross, saints. There is no fear in the perfect love of God. Man, oh man. Awesome. Awesome. Servando, a few weeks ago, laying in the woods, talked about that a couple weeks ago, laying in the woods, fell out of a tree stand, laying there, the very last words out of his mouth was, Lord, have mercy on my soul. Lord, have mercy on my soul. What a wonderful last words. Yeah, wonderful last words. He got it. He knew it. He was trusting. He knew in who he believed. He had full confidence to be absent from the body that was present with the Lord. He looked death right in the face and said, come on, death, bring it on. I know where I'm going. There is no death to those who know Jesus as their Savior. Yes. The grace of God. The grace of God provides forgiveness, regeneration, which means new life. We become new creations through the grace of God. The grace of God is sustaining ability to follow Jesus. See, saints, we don't just need Jesus to forgive us of our sins so we can go to heaven. We need Jesus so that we can live like him, so we can think like him, so that we can live and move and have our very existence in him. It's more than just, you know, it's a relationship. It's, it's, a, it's a living relationship.
The divine enablement of grace is to live free from the control of sin. God's grace empowers our faith. It fuels the human heart to seek God. God's grace produces joy, peace, delight, pleasure of life, the absence of fear. Christian virtues, the grace of God is what empowers us to produce Christian virtues. What's Christian virtues? Christian virtues are, are the character and qualities that Jesus reflected in his life and ministry. The grace of God is, is, gives us Christ-like character and divine empowerment for Christian service. So I'm going to switch into another part of this now. Um, we're not saved by good works, but turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to see where good works plays into the role of a, of a believer. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9. Paul writes to the, to the Ephesian church, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Pretty clear statement. I think we just pretty much covered that in the last 20 minutes or so that we were talking about the grace of God and uh, his unmerited favor upon us. But now look what he says next. So now he's talking to, he's talking at verse 8, he's saying, You guys are saved through faith in Christ, you receive the grace of God. It's not, a, it's not of your good works. But, verse 9 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we were recreated for the purposes of producing good works, producing the fruit of righteousness in our lives. You know, you don't... You, you, you can't be good to get God's attention to get into his kingdom. You have to be desperately in need. You have to recognize that you're, that you're uh, spiritually bankrupt and come to the place of depending upon the grace and mercy of God. Once you receive the grace and mercy of God, once you've been recreated, once you receive the mind of Christ, once you receive a new heart, once you receive a new nature, once you receive the empowerment that comes from grace and mercy, now you're called to do good works. So you're, you're not saved by good works, you're saved unto good works. You're getting the, the clarity difference in this, saints, okay? So when somebody asks you, you know, what is your hope? The Bible says every one of us needs to be ready to answer why the hope, what the hope of is in our life, what the hope, of it, hope is in our heart. Our hope is what? Based in the mercy and the grace of God. It has to be upon that. But it's not just... It's not greasy grace where it's just you go about and live your life and do whatever you want to do and just you know, live devoid of that. I mean, if, if you've really got grace, if you've really got mercy, then you're empowered. You're a new person. There's a change that has occurred in you. This is what it says here that we are, verse 9, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I'm going to read to you the Amplified Translation. This is the Amplified tra Translation of Ephesians 2.9. For we are his workmanship, his own master work, a work of art, created in Christ Jesus, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, ready to be used for good works, which God prepared for us beforehand, taking paths which he set so that we would walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us. I love that. One of the translators talks about this. We are his workmanship. That word workmanship is a masterpiece of recreation. When God created the earth, he spoke everything into existence, but man was special. He, had, he knelt down on the ground. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit knelt down on the ground, and they gathered up dust and formed man in the, in, in, from the dust of the ground and did what? Breathed in him the wuwa, the breath of God, was breathed in him, and he became a spiritual living being. That's what Adam became. As a matter of fact, Adam would still be alive today as a physical, spiritual being had he not eat of, eaten of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. He would still be alive. He would be 6,000 years old today walking the earth. In the same way, saints, God has made us his masterpiece of recreation. So the masterpiece is, the, is, is what? Probably what is the masterpiece of, uh, is it, who was it that did the Sistine Chapel? Leonardo da Vinci, yeah, probably his masterpiece known as what? 
the Sistine Chapel, the finger of God coming out and touching man and all, you know, all that kind of, he did all kind of other artwork, did all the other kind of stuff, but he was most noted for was his masterpiece was the, was the Fresno on the top of the, the Sistine Chapel, right? So in that same way, <laughs> that, what is it? Michelangelo. Michelangelo. You guys, look at that. You let me down the wrong path. It's a good thing. It's Michelangelo. <laughs> yeah, Leonardo da Vinci, I don't know. He, he, he invented all kind of crazy. That dude, was, that dude was a prophet, man. He invented, and it, he drew drawings of submarines and flying planes and all kind of stuff that, that was, he was dreaming about before man even could, could invent it. If you know Jesus as your personal Savior, if you know that your name is in the book of life, and you have that same, at least some level of confidence, like Dick did, what am I still here for? You know, like Saranda did, Lord, have mercy on my soul. If you have that, saints, then you are God's masterpiece of recreation. He recre recreated you as a masterpiece. And, and, and the masterpiece of rec rec recreation does what? People, people look at the Sistine Chapel and think of what? Michelangelo. Come on, let's get it right. Michelangelo. You know? <laughs> they think of Michelangelo like, man, that guy was incredible. How did he do that? Way back then, and paints and all this stuff that's still up there, all this, it draws attention to the artist, right? So when we were a masterpiece of recreation, we're not the same person we were before we became born again. We're not even the same person this year that we were last year because we're being changed and transformed line upon line, precept upon precept, little here, little there. We're being changed into the likeness of Jesus and we're reflecting Jesus. What's that do? It, looks, it, it, it takes attention not to us, we're not this. Hey, Rich, look at you looking, you know. No, it's like, man, there's God in heaven. Look what God has done in this person's life. Look how God has taken this person who was bound in addiction and sin and darkness and has liberated them and set them free and made them a new person in Christ. And now they're functioning, loving, you know, look at this person who was angry and bitter. And now this person's full of love and expression of forgiveness. Man, God is something. There must be God in heaven, right? When I first got saved back in 78, I was a party in Hellraiser before that. And when the word got out that I got saved, I actually heard people say, there must be God if Rich Liptak's a Christian. <laughs> yeah, really. There must be a God if Rich Liptak's a Christian. Then I'll run into those guys from high school that I haven't seen in 30, 40 years, you know, running the grocery store. You still into that Jesus stuff? <laughs> yeah, I am, because he's in me, so I'm in him. You know, we're in each other. Wow, all this time, man. Always, some, you know, it's, you know it's, it's, it speaks a testimony. It's a testimony of that. It's not... I'm so great, I'm such a strong man of God. No, it's because God's grace and mercy. Because I go to the fountain of grace and mercy on a regular basis to, to, to have my soul restored and replenished. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty or puffed up or arrogant, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they will be rich in good works. Rich, say that with me, rich in good works. Ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So you might think, well, that doesn't apply to me because I'm, I'm just kind of a poor guy. I'm just... I'm just a laborer, I'm just a whatever, I'm, you know, I just work here, I work there. You know, you realize, saints, that the, the poorest person in this, in this church today, the poorest person in this church today is living like a king compared to many of the world around us. I've been there, I've seen people in Honduras, one meal a day, you know, they have two sets of clothing, you know, they sleep on, the, on a hammock, uh, walk everywhere that they go. Some of them, things are much better in Honduras than they were when we first started going there, but when we started going to Honduras over 20 years ago, People would walk to church in their bare feet carrying their shoes because they only had one pair of shoes and they didn't want to wear them out. They put their shoes on before they came into church to have shoes on in church. So the poorest one among us is living like kings. We really are. I'm not sure what the... It used to be that we contain about 8% of the world's population, but we consume about 65% of the world's goods. So 8% of the population of the planet is consuming 65% of the world's goods. So tell me you're not living like kings and priests in the, in the natural sense. This is Titus, a couple more verses here. I have three verses in Titus. Titus chapter 2, 
Verse 14, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, clear-minded, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people. Say it with me zealous for good works. Say it with me. Zealous for good works. Zealous for good works. So there's a, there's a zeal, there's a passion that we should have for good works, for spreading the good news of Jesus, for spreading the love of Jesus in words and actions and deeds. Titus 3, 8. This is a faithful saying, and, and these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. He wants you to be, I'm supposed to, he's telling uh, Titus, saying, constantly remind them to maintain good works. Maintain good works. He repeats it in verse uh, 14 of chapter 3. Maintain good, uh, and let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. Our good works are a witness to others, saints. Our good witness, our, our good works is a witness to others. You've heard me say this before. There are people that you are associated with at work, in your community, in your circles, outside of the church community here, that the only Bible that they've ever read is, is, the life, is your life. Your life is, a, Paul said, that, we, that our lives are a living letter known and read of all men. People are watching. People are reading our lives, and, they're, if, and I hope that they see Jesus on the pages of our lives. You know, as, they, as they look through our lives, they need to see Jesus on us. Look at 1 Peter. Chapter 2, verse 12. Worship team, you guys want to come up? This is the last verse I'm going to look at. 1 Peter 2, 12. Beloved, I beg you as certain sojourners and pilgrims to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Our lives are to be a living example to others. There should be good works flowing from us. The people, Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, what? By the love that you have one for another. So love has to be the motivating factor. From the love, you can't, how can the love of God be in you if you see someone who's hungry and you say, go in peace and, and you know, be filled, but yet, and you have the wherewithal to help them and you've not helped them. Where's the love of God in you? If you see someone who's naked, say you ought to be clothed, don't be naked, but you're not supplying them clothing, then where's the love of God in you? you know, so there needs to be these actions of love that are, that are emanating from our, from our lives. And what's going to happen is when God, sh that's two things, there's two parts of this visitation. When God shows up on a person's life and knocks on their door, like Jesus knocked on my door on June 21st, 1978, and invited me, and, and, you know, knocked on the door and said, hey, can I come in? I want to come into your life. I want to, I want to make you, you know, a follower of me. When that moment comes, People are going to know that it's Jesus by the Jesus they saw in us when we demonstrated good works to them. That's what, that's what the scripture passage means. Also, there's going to be a time when judgment comes. Judgment's going to come, and someone who, who's, not, who's rejected Jesus, all those that are going to go to hell, the ones that are going to hell are the ones that have rejected the grace of God and the mercy of God. They're going to say, you saw the demonstration of the grace and the mercy of God in the lives of my masterpieces of recreation. They spoke of, what I, of my capabilities and my desires for you. You could have had that same experience. The good works that they did was a, was a testimony to you. And now you're going to be judged by you not responding by the impact that those good works had on others. Man, what a part we play, saints. We play a significant part in the advancement of God's kingdom. Every single one of us, every single one of us has opportunities available to us every single day to represent Jesus in some way, in some word, in some action, some simple thing. We do. Let's all stand to our feet. The Bible says if one plants, another waters, God gives the increase. And we, when we see new, new birth occurred, let's raise our hands to the Lord. Repeat after me, Father God, I thank you for the great grace and the mercy you've shown me. Lord God, 
empower me by your grace and by the enablement of Holy Spirit to, to bring forth good works that glorify you and advance your kingdom. Lord Jesus, I stand here today available to you. Use me, Holy Spirit. Guide and direct my life each day. Open my eyes to the possibilities around me, to the fields that are white to harvest, that I might be used by you to advance your kingdom through love and good works. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to your name. Praise your God. Praise your God. Thank you, Jesus.